Good evening and welcome to SVG TV's Evening News and Sports for Monday, November 4th. I'm Khalil Cato and these are the details. Operators of local pharmacies are being warned against counterfeit drugs which may find their way into the country. This advice comes from the chairperson of the Pharmacy, of the pharmacy Council, Joanne Ince-Jack. Speaking at a symposium on, she was speaking at the time at a symposium on pharmacy practice practices in SVG on Saturday. Ince Jack warns that counterfeiters target any kind of drugs, especially those which are expensive and are in high demand. Examples are expensive lifestyle lifestyle drugs such as Viagra, the most counterfeited drug in the world, and Cialis, anti-cancer drugs like Zodex and Arimidex and um, antibiotics like, like meropenem, hypertension and cholesterol lowering medicines, hormones, supplements, steroids, and even inexpensive gener generic versions of painkillers. In developing countries, the most disturbing issue is the common availability of counterfeit drugs for life-threatening conditions such as malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV and AIDS. There can be no double standards in the quality of pharmaceutical products distributed to end users. This was emphasized by Minister of Health Clayton Bergen, who said it is important that the cost of the products reflect their quality. I am minded to state here that the Pharmacy Council needs to be always reminded of this fact. Nothing, ladies and gentlemen, should be put before quality and the consequential risks for patients' health. Counterfeit pharmaceutical products present a new and serious threat to health care delivery. At the 41st World Health Assembly, resolution was adopted requesting governments and pharmaceutical manufacturers to cooperate in the detection and prevention of substandard pharmaceutical preparations. And I would wish to emphasize that society and all innocent parties in the health care chain are victims when counterfeit occurs. Minister Bergen further stated the importance of persons working together in an atmosphere of mutual cooperation and trust rather than criticism. I am advised that there is evidence that trade in counterfeit is facilitated where there is a weak regulatory control and enforcement. Public health consideration demands that pharmaceutical products should not be treated as ordinary commodities. They must conform to prescribed standards and be rigorously controlled. These precautions tend to assure the quality of authentic products and pre prevent infiltration of illicit products in the supply system. And drug inspector Steve Millington is urging pharmacists and other persons here to look at methods as best to look at methods as to how best to dispose of pharmaceuticals properly. One of the main objective for starting is to se separate the pharmaceutical into categories that require different disposal methods. Not all pharmaceutical prep preparations should be discarded similar in, in like manner, hence they should be sorted. Generally, top priority is always given to control medications or narcotics that um, carries with it international regulations which we have to adhere to. Even expired one, we have to account for them to the INCB. So hence the method for disposal is, is different. And anti, especially anti neoplastic which is very contaminant, can cause, um, if exposed to the environment, the hazards they can cause to, to life, um, then it's, it, it's a serious situation. So then we have to monitor those drugs. Saturday's symposium was hosted by the SVG Pharmacy Council in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Pharmaceutical Procurement Services, OECS PPS. The overall objective was to sensitize health professionals about the legal matters affecting the pharmacy practice in SVG and to ensure that the population has access to safe, essential, effective and good quality medicines. The new geothermal project currently being undertaken here, along with the current supply, is said to have the ability to meet approximately 75% of the hydropower demand here. On Friday, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez told the media that at the moment, the power plants here provide approximately 4 megawatts of hydropower and will soon have the ability to provide 5. Dr. Gonzalez says the project 
That should be Dr. Gonzalez says, with the geothermal project promising to provide an extra 10 megawatts, this will accommodate for more than th three quarters of the peak demand of a 20, 20 to 21 megawatts. That already will put you at 15 um, megawatts. That will put you at three quarters as to where you are at this at this time. Now, clearly, if we make the savings which we anticipate, because the energy unit tells me that with a 10 megawatt geothermal plant, of course the investment and tool is in the order of 50 million US dollars or so, for all the work. But the savings to be avoided, fuel cost savings to be avoided if you have the geothermal, I'm told it's going to be in the region of 20 million US dollars, 16 to 20 million US dollars. I know that's a significant savings in given the cost of the fuel. Dr. Gonzalez says the geothermal project promises big savings, which will also benefit consumers. Because clearly you have, there has to be a return on the investment, and then of course it has to be transmitted. And Vinlec has a, a fixed costs, the transmission lines, the, 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 the the insurance of those transmission lines, the, the, the cost of those transmission lines, the payback for their loans which they, they got to, to do all their work, um, the salaries and so forth of the workers in Vinlec from the manager go right down. So they're, they're, they're a fixed set of costs. But the point is this, it is clear that there are substantial changes, substantial savings, sorry, which we could be getting. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, the PSU has postponed its general elections pending the outcome of a lawsuit. We have more stories, that plus more on the local scene when SVG TV Evening News continues. Welcome back to the evening news. Still on the local scene, today the Public Service Union announced its decision to postpone its scheduled general meeting and elections for Tuesday. That's tomorrow. Committee member Elroy Boucher told members of the local media that the decision to push back the elections is to await the outcome of a lawsuit by the union's former president, Kools Van Loo. Boucher says the interim committee has received a summons on the hearing of, on the, hearing of the matter for November 13th and, on advice from their lawyer, has decided to put a hole on the elections as they don't wish to do anything to hurt the union. Boucher says inasmuch as they have been mandated to act and conduct elections by the members of the union, they do not think it would be in the union's best interest to have members vote for a new executive under the current circumstances. We therefore undertook not to hold elections until cleared by the court. So as it, at this point, the injunction is set for tomorrow, but the union is set for Wednesday, sorry, the 6th. It is set for the 6th of November, and, but we have decided that we're going to hold on the elections. It is ironic that that would have been adjourned for that day when the elections really was going to be held on Monday. So it really didn't prevent us from holding the elections. But like I said, with the interest of the union at heart, it is the only correct and proper thing to do. Boucher says that they are very mindful that the current situation before them is not about the immediate past executive or the interim committee, but about the approximately 1,400 members of the Public Service Union. So we just wish the members to know, the members of the union and the public, that we are only acting in the interests of the members, only in their interests and nothing else. Because if it were not for their interest alone, we might have gone ahead and have elections tomorrow. But you don't want a new executive coming into place under such uncertainty. I also wish to state that all of this court matter, this legal matter, has affected the membership in a significant way. They are unable to claim 
their medical relief, which is normally paid when when our members go to the doctor, they have a, uh, they can claim a refund once pay of $75. And there's a lot of that piling up now because they have some their claims. Ministers of Agriculture from the OECS and other stakeholders commenced a two-day meeting here earlier today looking at governance for agricultural development and food nutrition security. The meeting, taking place at the NIS conference room, will also look at the implementation of the revised Plan of Action for the Agriculture Industry 2012-2022. Addressing this morning's opening ceremony, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture, Raymond Ryan, says several initiatives taken thus far show that there is a strong political will and commitment to confront the challenges associated with improving agricultural and rural development, enhancing food security, and achieving lasting social and economic prosperity for member states. Ryan describes the meeting as timely, noting that it will allow participants to gain knowledge on the role of different stakeholders for the development of an institutional framework for food, for food and nutrition security, among other areas. To take action to promote capacity building and empowerment of civil society, non-state non -state stakeholders, non-state stakeholders, youth, women and vulnerable groups through collective actions to promote multi-sectorial political dialogue as a vehicle for food and nutrition security as a top priority in the sub-regional and national and political agendas in the OECS to promote research sharing of information and mobilization of resources to deal with specific issues that arise related to FNS. FAO Caribbean Sub-Region Coordinator J.R. Deep Ford pointed out that they have already done the work as it relates to the preparation of the revised OECS Plan of Action for Agriculture, held consultations and agreed on the contents of the document. And now is the time to consult on how the management of the implementation process, which he says will need, which he says will need all hands on deck. The questions for us today are how do we govern this process effectively? How do we translate commitments into actions? How do we build the coalitions that are needed? How do we get the policies in place to provide the incentives for change? What are the institutional frameworks that are necessary to provide evidence and recommendations on measures and mechanisms? What are the relationships between these institutional frameworks at the national and sub-regional and regional and global levels? How do we manage these relationships to maximize synergies and benefits? How do we foster greater participation and accountability? How do we ensure collaboration and continuity within governmental systems, within our parliaments, with the private sector, and civil society. And despite the challenges facing the local agriculture industry, farmers are being commended for forging ahead to keep the industry alive. This commendation comes from Minister of Agriculture Saboto Caesar, who paid a visit to the Geest Shed earlier today, where a large quantity of root crops were being prepared for, export, for exportation to regional and extra-regional markets. Caesar says farmers are doing much more than making a livelihood for themselves, noting that they are actually helping with nation building. According to the minister, despite their own challenges, local farmers continue to export significant quantities of root crops, and this year they are expected to see an increase in the numbers being exported, especially to Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago, in terms of their imports of root crops, they import 98% of their root crops from St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And they have noted, their consumers have noted, that the premium quality that they get on their market from St. Vincent and the Grenadines is basically second to none. So I really want to continue to encourage those persons who are into the root crops. We are also seeing as well this year a significant increase in the export of plantains. Plantains to Barbados, to the British Virgin Islands and also to Trinidad and Tobago. 
CSA is also assuring farmers involved in dashing production that they are seeking alternative markets so that they can maintain the prices for the crop which is currently being affected by competition on the Trinidad and Tobago market. He said they are also tweaking a final plan for the restructuring of the banana industry and the roles stakeholders are expected to play, noting that the fullest cooperation from all banana farmers will be needed for the implementation of the plan. We expect that um, at the end of the day, we'd all come together, all hands on deck, so that we could continue to build this very important subsector. The banana industry continues to play a very important role in the development of many developing countries. And definitely there is a significant role for the banana industry to play in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As was noted, and as we would have seen on our record to show, that 36 months. It is 36 months since we would have suffered from Hurricane Thomas. Black Sigatoka in 2012. Yet we still see persons continuing to plant more bananas. A lot of bananas is going on the, the, the regional market. However, we are working to ensure that our quality is increased so that we can begin to send greater volumes to the extra region. As it relates to the banana accompanying measures, Minister Caesar says they are currently working out the finances as they are hoping for its full implementation early in the new year. The UWI Open Campus is this week hosting its annual open house. A team from the Mona Campus in Jamaica, along with the marketing officer at the Cavill Campus, are here to share information on programs, the application process, and admission procedures of the university. In a brief interview with SVG TV News, Senior Assistant Registrar at the Mona Campus, Marsha Morgan Allen, says that they are looking forward to meeting students from the various educational institutions that they will be visiting during their one-week visit. Um, tomorrow we have a um, couple of visits. We're going to Bakery, Community High, um, as well as Sandy Bay Secondary, Intermediate High School. In the evening, we're doing a radio program, nice radio, between the hours of 8 and 10 p.m. On the Wednesday, we have other activities such as visiting um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College, Arts, uh, Sciences and General Studies, as well as a teacher division speaking to those uh, students at the Community College. Um, we'll also be visiting St. Vincent's con Convent later on, as well as St. Vincent Girls High School, George Stevens Secondary, and again in the evening we'll be having a radio program on um, the VFM's Voices in the Night, 8 to 10 p.m. On Thursday, we have three visits again, Union Allen Secondary, uh, Petit Bordel Secondary, as well as the St. Vincent Boys Grammar School. Friday is our big day, whereby we'll be having our open day. According to a media release, Friday's open day, which, we ha which will be held at the University Center from 1.30, is an opportunity for parents and prospective students of the West Indies, of the University of the West Indies, that is, to meet and dialogue with faculty and administrative staff about the academic programs, scholarships, and other opportunities available at the university.